All right. So I'm assuming everyone can see and hear me just fine. If you can't, then, you know, it's not really much I can do about that. <laughs> but, uh, um, all right. So here is what I want to talk about. The truth. The truth. Uh, the truth. Uh, truth is difficult. I usually work in facts because, you know, truth is different to each, pe each different person. But I do want to talk about passwords, privacy, and breaches, as you can see. Now, this isn't just like, a, oh, let's talk about some rhetorical stuff and, you know, spend 45 to 50 minutes every day and then you forget it and just move on. I actually want to have this talk really focus in on actionable items, something you can leave this talk with and, you know, add that knowledge to your repertoire and hopefully become more secure because of it. That's really what I'm trying to accomplish here. So we'll talk about all the things, I'll talk about all the things you see up here. And uh, you know, I'm not gonna read off the slides, hopefully at all, but um, what I do wanna highlight here is that things happen, breaches happen, compromises happen. And in the world of the web, and even offline as well, when humans like us interact with companies, there's a lot that can go wrong as pertains to cybersecurity. The company that creates an API or a mobile app or a website or whatever we as users consume can screw it up in a lot of different ways. And even when they do a great job of developing their application or whatever it happens to be, their process for their physical business, there's things they can do that just kind of make you think twice. I'll give you an example of what I'm just popped in my head right now. I go to the dentist office, you know, a couple times a year, and you, you walk into the front lobby and there's just hundreds and hundreds of folders of all their patient information, like right behind the front desk. <laughs> like if I was a bad guy and I wanted to go, you know, cause some issues here, you know, nowadays it'd be ransomware and probably do it remotely, but if I just want to walk in there, grab all those people's records, that would cause an issue. You know, that would definitely cause, you know, a, you know, HIPAA issues. It would cause a, a breach of PII. And that's, you know, there's things that we can do to protect ourselves, and there's things that a business has to do. And that's really going to be a, a crux of this whole conversation is what we can do to help protect ourselves and what the businesses can do. Now, this is really aimed at you, but we'll, we'll talk through all the stuff you see up here. What happens when a breach really occurs, and where does that information end up going? And things like that. So it should be fun. And like I said, this is, a, this is just a little talk here, but I really want you to, to walk away with knowledge you can use. So by the end of this, hopefully you'll understand more about you know, what a breach is, why they happen. You'll learn to minimize your exposure of your own personal data, whether that's physically when you go into a store or a school or a dentist or online when you're you know, sharing your passwords, you're creating accounts, or whatever the case may be. And then lastly, of course, be able to make smart, educated decisions based on how tight you think your security needs to be with a given entity. And we'll learn more about that as we get into it. Now, who am I? Why should you even listen to me? Why are you even here? Well, this is why. Well, maybe not this is why, but this is who I am anyway. <laughs> Uh, my name is Serge Borso, just like Nick said during the introduction. I have about 15 years or so of information or cybersecurity experience and expertise. I started a company called SpiderSec about five years back, where we focused you know, on penetration testing, offensive security, OSINT, so on and so forth. And all the other stuff Nick said, it's all true. It's all right here. You can see it in graphical format, nonetheless. Uh, what does that mean? It means I'm an expert, essentially. And I don't really think I've really come out and said it ever until just now, but 15 years of doing this stuff, these are tales from the trenches. I've been here, I've done that, I've seen breaches, I've dealt with breaches, I've done you know instant response, a lot of penetration testing, I've seen a lot of things in my time, and I wanna share with you, the audience, these things I've learned and ways to get better. Now this really is focused on you, the human, not necessarily the company you work for, although what I'm gonna be speaking about certainly translates to more than one area. The other cool thing about this talk is I'm not gonna be talking 
the entire time, which depending on how these first five minutes have gone, you may be thinking, oh, great, <laughs> he's going to stop talking at some point. Uh, but in all seriousness, I do have a little live demo where I'm going to ask some of you to, to interact, and we'll, you know, we'll get to that when we get to that. All right, the first thing here is responsibility for security. And when I you hear this, you know, the second bullet point here, in the corporate environment, it's not uncommon. You know, everyone's responsible for security. Well, when when you hear that, and that's the motto of the business, I've seen that that quickly deteriorates into no one's responsible for security. There has to be people or a person, someone dedicated, a team, if you will, that's going to say, you know, this is our responsibility and this is what we're going to do. Each of us as individuals has our own parts our own role that we play in helping secure the organization or us personally. Uh, but there's two sides to it. And yeah, I got some jokes on here too a little bit. <laughs> if you're reading the slides, yeah, we, we always want to blame somebody. When something goes wrong, we got to point the finger at somebody and, and blame them. But uh, the truth is, you know, of course, um, we got to own it ourselves. We have to take responsibility, step up, and essentially come down to the, the point where it's like, there's things we can do to help secure our own accounts, our own PII, personally identifiable information, our own sensitive information. And there's things that we don't really have control over. And we're gonna delve into that here pretty deeply in just a second. Okay, the other thing I do want to kind of hi highlight here, um, as a big X-Files fan, if you may remember X-Files from back in the day, you know, don't trust, you know, trust no one type of thing. Um, I'm not here to bash a company an enterprise, an organization at all. A lot of companies do take security quite seriously, period. There are those that try, and there are those that just don't take security seriously at all, which, you know, it's true of anything. Some people take things to the extreme. Some people don't even bother trying. Now, it's almost irrelevant how seriously a company takes security in the context of at the end of the day, what happens to your PII. And what do I mean by that? I mean, even if the company does everything right, we're talking they vet their employees before they hire them, do the background checks, do drug testing, do a lie detector, make sure they have the best people, the most trustworthy people working there. And they have all the best firewalls and IPSs and IDSs. They have a SOC, they have a red team, they do purple teaming, they have pen testers, they do you know, static code analysis, they do vulnerability scanning. I could go on like this for a long time. Suffice it to say, they do everything right, everything they're supposed to be doing, and they still get compromised. When that happens, the outcome is the same. When it's our personal information that's part of that breach, we're the victims, even though they did everything right. And that's you know highlighting that there's no such thing as 100% secure. That's just the reality. So what does this actually mean? Well, it means that it's a two-pronged approach. Not only does the company we're interacting with have to do a lot of things right, ideally, but we as the user of their platform also have to take security seriously, okay? So when we see a form, like this. So we've got a Facebook form up here and we have you know some other little password requirement thing down there. Password requirements, it says eight to thirty-two characters. Eight is that strong? Well, it depends. It really, really depends. Not well, not really too much. Eight characters isn't that strong. <laughs> but if you're using all thirty-two characters uh in this specific example, then you know that's password length, password strength. It's interesting though. So a typical user, which I am not, by the way, so I feel it's difficult for me to really get in the shoes of, in the mindset of what an average user does and what they think about, because I don't do things the way regular people do things as it pertains to online accounts and security and forms like this. I have a password vault. Password vault meaning I have like a, an application on some of my machines. And you know, I have to log into the password vault to decrypt it, open it up, and then from there, I use this tool to create passwords for me, passwords that are the maximum, or you know, some some large quantity of characters that are complex and you know as random as they can be. 
before I create a new account on any any website out there. Most people don't do that. Most people aren't doing that at all. They may reuse passwords, which is extremely common, and they may choose the weakest password right here. You know, A123456. That's eight characters. It contains at least one letter and at least one number. Per this nice little box we're looking at on the slide deck here, that will meet the password complexity requirements for this website. So when people choose a weak password like that, there's real consequences. Now the yellow asterisk here, why can't it be longer than 32 characters? Well, for this specific you know, second screenshot here, why can't it be longer? Well, it, well that's a different conversation then might come back to that. So I'm gonna point the finger at myself and you know, in this day and age in the culture, we don't blame the victim. You know, that's not really what we do. It's not too popular. Uh, so I didn't include that phrase on my slides, but you can kind of read between the lines here if, you know, read it yourself type of thing. I had, uh, I have a sister and my sister, <laughs> she uh, she called me up. We were talking one day on the phone and she just kind of throws it out there says, oh yeah, but oh, and by the way, well, my uh, my Facebook account got hacked. And then she's, you know, continued talking about something else. I was like, wait, 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 back up. Your Facebook account got quote unquote, you know, hacked, the words that she used. She said, yeah. I said, well, what do you mean? I mean, I, I said, so you had a really weak password for your Facebook account, right? And she said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't very strong, but I changed it now. Whose fault is that? If you choose a weak password and then something bad happens, you want to blame the company who's website you create an account on i don't know i'm you know you, you see how i feel about it i wrote the slide deck you can read it for yourself um other things reusing passwords when that happens and you know account a gets compromised and now we have another account that we have on some of the website gets compromised we're talking snapchat facebook linkedin gmail all these common applications we use all the time if we use the same password across the spectrum and one of those gets compromised and an adversary puts the pieces together and compromises other accounts, you know, is that really the other entity's problem? Well, no, I don't think so. All right, so strong passwords, two-factor. You know, I'm talking about breaches here. I'm talking about the truth behind passwords, and, and this is the reality here. We have some responsibility to secure our own assets, and this is really what it comes down to. So two-factor authentication, 2FA, that's what that is. That does certainly make a difference. Strong passwords absolutely can help out. Hey Serge, we have a we have a couple of questions I just want to address real quick in the in the chat. So um, somebody asked, uh, well they stated they have a statement and then a question. They said pa password sharing is rampant in every company I've worked in. How do you get people over the hump of retraining themselves to use a password manager? Oh, um, that's that's a fair question. All right, so every organization you work at. They reuse passwords, they share passwords. How do you get people to start using a password vault or password manager or password safe, whatever you want to call it, the, the technology used to, to save passwords and store them? Well, that's a different conversation. And what I mean by that is culture. Culture plays a huge role in that. Depending where you work and the type of people in the business, um, I'm not going to, I don't want to say age, but, you know, different demographics <laughs> of people. Um, technical acumen, skill set, a password vault isn't right for everybody. A password vault may be too complex for certain people. And I'm, I even mentioned that at the end of this talk where education is, I guess, the, really the answer without belaboring the point. You have to educate people on here's the risk, here's the value, here's how it can save you time, here's how it can increase security for the company, and here's how you use the tool properly. You don't want to open up an issue where, oh, we use password vaults across the whole company, and 90% of the people don't really understand what the heck they're doing, so the password vault has a password of, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And within that password vault, it's all the other passwords. So you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot, figuratively speaking, of course. So education is where you have to focus your efforts in on that. And this may not be right for everyone in the whole company, straight up. So it's it's not like, I have a 
one thing you can do that's going to solve that problem, other than, of course, educating the people. Whose fault is it when the account's compromised? All right, so I'll give you some real-world stuff here. This is Trail from the Trench, and I've been doing this for a little bit of time. Uh, back in the day, I used to work in the online. Go ahead. Sorry, so I was going to say, you did, you did have one more question uh, a little bit ways back, and I didn't want to have to address on it. At the end of your talks, it's a little relevant more. Um, there's a question in here. What are companies that are not security, like let's say web dev or gaming dev, or um, companies that by their nature take security a bit more seriously? Um, like what are the companies that, that actually take security seriously typically? Like not really big companies, but the smaller ones. Do you know of them? Like what types of companies? <laughs> <laughs> what types of companies? Uh, yes, companies with good leadership. Companies where people like you and I work, Nick, those are the type of companies that take it seriously, where they have people who are passionate about security and know how to articulate their passion in such a way that management listens. There is a solid answer, I think. What do you What do you think, Nick? Was that good? I thought that was good. I, I think that was like uh, like dead on. I mean, that is definitely dead on solid. <laughs> it, it, it totally depends on leadership. Leader, it comes from top down, and the lower people, the the people that are dedicated, make a huge difference. But if your leadership doesn't care, it's it's going to make the company's security affected. Absolutely, and good people typically, good security folks typically don't stay around those type of companies. You know, there has to be some give and take where you have a budget, you have people who care, you have management who cares, and you have the money behind it to have a good program. And then you get solid people in there. And that could be any industry, any company, any size, quite frankly. Usually you're seeing this in, you know, medium size and up because, um, you know, it's a cost center. Security is a cost center. It's not making money for the business. It's an expense. So you usually don't want to pay the extra expense until you have a good, solid business case to do so. Quite frankly, that's just the reality of it. Um, nevertheless, getting smart people in there who take it seriously. It could be any any industry out there. All right, so this uh, and any other questions, just you know, hit me up. Bank talk, online banking industry, saw this type of stuff all the time. Where we had, I was in charge of among many other things of fraud, where we'd see people, we we basically profiled you as a user. So if you log into you know Bank of America as an example or something like that, and you normally log in from your house. And you normally log in, you know, every Friday at you know, 6 p.m. And you always use Chrome. That's that's data points. Those are all data points we can track. Your, the time, the IP address, the browser slash user agent. What do you normally do? Do you do a transfer? Do you do a bill pay? Do you do an ACH? Do you just check your balance? Do you do a, a mobile deposit? Whatever it is, we can profile every single thing you do. And when we did this, this was like 10 years ago, we were doing this. What we'd see is certain instances where there'd be large deviation. All of a sudden, you your account is accessed from Russia at you know, 3 o'clock in the morning using Opera, some odd, no, I shouldn't say odd browser, <laughs> a not super common browser, and you go straight to the wire transfer page. Those are all, you know, five data points there that, oh, time is off, IP is off, location is off. What you clicked on is, is just a deviation from the norm. You saw it all the time fraud what we had to deal with though was users and their experience with their financial institution whether it's a bank or a credit union there'd be instances where there was fraud and those deviation points were much more minute as in the ip address changed but the location was very similar and what the user did was pretty similar and there'd be fraud and it wasn't easy to detect so we've had an issue where we had a business banking account they lost over a hundred thousand dollars and we think it was because of a cross-site request forgery attack and Micah delve into CSERF attacks during this conversation but suffice it to say the victim who lost a hundred thousand dollars was tricked into basically submitting a fraudulent request without their knowledge and they lost a bunch of money and from the bank's perspective and all the logs that we had, the request looked like it came from the user's browser because it did. The user logs in, you know, username and password, here's your session token. And anything that happens after that happens within the session of that, that browser and that user and that online banking website. So 
when fraud occurs, they go back and say, well, what IP address? Well, it was your home IP address, the IP address you always have. What browser? Well, it's a browser you always use, and so on and so forth. The point is, the bank's pointing the finger at the user, the user's pointing the finger at the bank, saying, I want my money back. And the bank's saying, it's gone, and it looks like you moved it. You, have, you can't prove it wasn't you. Why? Because there's a cross-site request forgery vulnerability in the application. And it's difficult to prove whose fault it was. So what could the user have possibly done? What could the bank have possibly done? Well, obviously there's a flaw with the bank, and obviously there's some things that the user probably could have done as well. But the point is, you gotta take some responsibility here, both of us, the business and the user. So here is some reality for you. Username harvesting, if I talked about account enumeration attacks, I'd be talking for like 30 minutes. So I'm gonna suffice it to say, as a penetration tester who does a lot of web app penetration testing, and the like, there is a very high probability that a motivated attacker can go to any website out there, you know, any Facebook, any Gmail, any Twitter, any any website that's common that you're thinking about right now, go to that website and use a vulnerability in that website or functionality, if you will, to ascertain what a valid username is. 95% of websites out there, about, I don't know, something like that. I see that when I do penetration testing all the time. So it's about 95% of the time I see it, and that's what the stat I put on here. I can get your username, period. So I already have your username. What do I do with your username? Well, it depends. How strong is your password? Do you have two-factor authentication turned on? And really, if from our perspective as a user, if someone has our username and they're just guessing our password, what can we possibly do about that? Not a whole lot, quite frankly. Not a whole lot. So even if we have a great password, we can still be compromised. Even if we have two-factor authentication sometimes, we can still be compromised. So here's a few popular ones. Yahoo, Equifax, and Apple. And yeah, to greater or less than extents, things happen. We've seen from these breaches that there's a lot of ways that a company can make cybersecurity mistakes company responsible for the website has a lot of responsibility for security. There's only so many things we can do. Okay, what I mean by that is if you go to create an account and the password form only allows up to 15 character passwords, you're stuck. You either, if you're gonna use that website and that account, you can't make a password that has more than 15 characters, period. But what happens if it doesn't allow special characters? And you have even a weaker password. What happens if there's no two-factor authentication being offered by the web application? Well, guess what? You're not going to have two-factor authentication for that website. And you, as the user, pay the price because of that. So with iCloud, what do we learn? Well, when we have an adversary who's trying to break into people's accounts and they already have your username and they're just guessing your passwords, this is an automated type of attack, by the way, a script or a tool being used to guess a bunch of passwords for your account. We want to make sure we lock out the account after a certain amount of fail login attempts, period. That would be a good one. So the Yahoo breach, <laughs> which one? Um, they did have some MD5 hashing for some passwords. That was a lesson learned. MD5 hashing, we'll talk about that here in, the, in a moment, but the point is yet another issue. So account lockout mechanisms, hashing a password in a database, Equifax, you know, that's you know, using vulnerable components with applications. Issues, issues that you and I can't do anything about. We don't get to choose from a little drop down box. Uh, when I create this password, I'd like to be hashed with MD5 or bcrypt. Yeah, right, that doesn't, it doesn't happen. <laughs> the application does whatever it wants to do. And because of that, we have issues when breaches occur of our data being compromised. All right, so we have some responsibility the website or company owner has some responsibility. So let's talk about this. If an adversary has a username and they know what your password is, uh, and the application doesn't lock you out, that's an issue. If the company doesn't hash your password, when the breach occurs, that makes our PII, our account information, much more vulnerable to attack. Now, note, we can't do anything about 
password guessing as a user. As a user, we can't do anything about password hashing. And of course, this last bullet point here, if there's an Apache struts vulnerability, yeah, that's kind of outside of our purview as a user of a website or as a consumer of a business. Okay, if we go to Lowe's and they don't have cameras and someone mugs us in the parking lot, well, hopefully someone has a cell phone that saw that. We have some evidence and some proof, but we don't really have control over Lowe's parking lots cameras. Same concept here, whether it's physical or online, we don't have control over hashing and updating <laughs> software for a website. It kind of goes without saying, but it's interesting if you think about it because these are just things we don't really have control over. What else? If the company doesn't have two-factor authentication, if the company doesn't support long and complex passwords, what's the pattern here? The pattern here is us as users have no control over any of this. So what does this equate to? Remember, this is aimed at us. People like us, users of applications, customers of, of various businesses out there. So we want to keep some certain information in mind, as in we want to do the best we can do to walk away with a higher level of security. This is something that came up on a LinkedIn post maybe like a few months ago, and it really bothered me. So my little message regarding this password strength graphic is on the left in white. I'm not going to read it, but uh, I was pretty annoyed when I saw it. So I responded to it. If you look at this password strength thing in the graphic, you'll see there's a simple little chart, the length of the password, and how long it's gonna take to, to break that password. I, I guess that's what it means. Which, just so we all know, is total crap. Total garbage. Why? Not all passwords are created equally. Not all applications password management is created equally. So what do I mean by this? Well, even if you and I use a password vault, and even if there's two-factor authentication, and even if we have a nice complex password from our vault, the two-factor authentication could be broken, and or the password that we're using for the website, once we submit it to the application, create our account or log in with it, may not be hashed or secured well enough in a database. So let's do a little demo and check it out. Now, this is a live demo, and I'm asking for your participation, which I may totally regret here in just a minute. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I want you to go to this website, if you choose to do so, obviously, and just create an account. You can see it's a very, very basic little website. And make sure you don't share any real passwords or anything um, that's inappropriate, like a, you know, a bad word or something. Because in a minute here, part of this demo is I'm going to show you the password that you submit to this website. So this is a, a demo of how the business could totally screw this up. So go ahead and take you know 30 seconds or so. Go to https colon slash slash evilsite.info forward slash login.php. And don't let the name throw you off, right? Evil site doesn't mean it's evil site. Hey, sir, oh, did, you know, did you pray to the demo gods before this happened? No, I just tested it <laughs> before I started. <laughs> I feel like you should have prayed to the demo gods. I think that's like a requirement for demos, isn't it? Oh, uh, you're trying to tell me it's broken already? No, no, we're not going to wood over here. Uh, all right. Ooh, it looks like I've <laughs> done some SQL injection attacks on this before. Oh, um, my name fine. is Nick W. And my password is going to be nice. Um, nice. All right, I'll submit this. And hey, my account was created successfully. Sweet. Cool. All right, pretty straightforward. 
And we've had enough time. Hopefully, you've each had a chance to do something like that. Oh, of course. <laughs> Let me uh, duplicate that session. Told you, dude. Demo gods. Dude, dude. Now I have to. Sh oh, man, this is not going to be good. <laughs> uh, can I pause sharing my screen for a second? <laughs> Yeah, that's fine. Um, we do have a question, I believe. Um, Hobbits is asked, is 15 characters, is it pretty good or no um, for a password a length? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's all in context. It, it depends. So what are you trying to secure, really, is what it comes down to. What I mean by that is if it's something that's super uh, sensitive, then 15 characters might not be enough. I don't use 15 character passwords, personally but that's just me, you know. Um, it depends where you're going to. I mean, there's a lot of different things to it, take into account. And what I mean by that is, it's like, if you're going to your bank, then maybe that's more important than some of the websites you go to, and you might want to have a stronger password. The, the point here is that if you're asking about numbers and lengths and stuff like that, then the issue is that you're probably remembering your passwords anyway, and that's the issue. You want to be using a password vault or a password safe and not remembering your password to begin with. Otherwise, we wouldn't So, have Serge, that's a, that's a good segue. We got another question of what password managers do you like slash recommend? Ooh. Now, I'm agnostic, so I'm not going to say one or the other, but um, you can always use something like uh, password safe. There's key pass. There's uh, what did you use, Nick? So it, it, it depends on the day. So so Bitwarden's great, um, and, and I like it because you can host it at yourself. Um, you can host it locally, like in your home lab or your home servers, and, and if you want, you can make it available to the internet anywhere you go. So it's kind of that travel with you. Um, if you're looking for ease of use for individuals that don't need it for um, multiple systems over time or traveling, like an elderly uh, individual or anything like that. Um, KeePass is great for that, that local system where you don't have to share it. Uh, I really like that for local. Uh, and then if you, you do have those individuals that uh, travel and like to use browsers and have passwords there all the time, LastPass is another great option. Um, I do recommend setting up multi-factor on all of the options that you have that are cloud-based. But other than that, that's, that's what I would recommend. It's, it's based on hey, ease, how do I, ease of use. How do I go back to share my screen? Oh, um, there we go. You did it. Thank you. Yep. Somebody hooked me up. All right, good. Everybody can see. Good to go. Uh, you're right, though. Sweet. All right, and here is 35 different people. <laughs> hey, there we go. Craig Barry or st uh, Staple. Yeah, there we go. Possible viability. Here's all your passwords. And what's the point of this? Ooh, nice. There's a unique one. Um, demo guards, do your worst. <laughs> Thank you. There's my Nick one that I put in. Eh, thanks for keeping it um, <laughs> professional. This could have gone a lot worse than my SSH session timing out. Hey, there's a good one. Sweet. Yeah, I was going to say, dude, point? <laughs> you, you trusted the audience to, I mean, they did a great job, but we, you trusted an audience full of a bunch of uh, hackers and security professionals to keep it professional? Yeah, man. There's a code of conduct on the website for for this conference, right? So I mean, just everyone still, must have read ask, it. Asking people to submit things. I mean, you got you know this industry. We're fun. I'm more concerned about yeah. I'm more concerned about uh, exploiting a vulnerability I'm unaware of on this website than <laughs> showing a inappropriate password. Uh, with that, I should probably turn this thing off. But anyway, what's the point here, guys? What's the point? The point is, let me go back a slide. All right, so password becomes the only thing between our account and the attacker. What does that mean? Even if you choose a great password, the company might not be hashing it well. And for those of you not familiar with the word hashing, I know I've thrown it out there a few different times. Let me be clear and kind of just give you some background on what that actually means. A hash is the opposite of clear text. So all these different passwords you see in here that you just created, that some of you guys created, is clear text. This, just so we're all clear, <laughs> should never, ever, ever exist on any real website. When, when you create an account, your password should be hashed, hashed with 
a strong algorithm. Not MD5, like the Yahoo example, not SHA, not SHA-256, it should be done with the bcrypt or S-crypt. And this isn't like a big AppSec conversation here. This is this little sidebar to say, when the application owners, the website owners, the company, whomever it is, when they screw up security, we pay the price for it. And just so we're all on the same page here, it's not like any of us would ever know how they're hashing or failing to hash in the background. We don't know. I can't go to log into LinkedIn and say, oh, they're using they're using MD5 for sure. No, that's not how it works. That's not how it works at all. There's just no way to easily tell that. And the other thing, HTTPS, you guys went to HTTPS colon slash dash. I just got an SSL certificate this morning for free. It took me five minutes to do. So just because you have HTTPS in front of it, that means nothing. Just a heads up on that. So I want to make it clear. We don't really know what's happening behind the scenes. Unless you're doing a pen test engagement or you work for the company that is the subject of your inquisition, we have no idea. Typical, typical businesses we deal with, we don't know if they're doing a good job or doing a bad job until something bad happens and we get some information on it. And usually, quite frankly, that information is limited anyway. So you don't always get the detailed information and analysis, even in this cybersecurity community, that would be really helpful for us to learn and get better. Nevertheless, other things here, if you're thinking, well, dude, I just created an account on your website and I saw my password, do other websites do that? Isn't that illegal? Well, other websites may be doing that. It's not illegal, it's horrible security, but it's not like there's a law that says, oh, you have to do it this way. <laughs> there, there's a business best practice, but very much like one of the first questions that was asked, thank you for these questions, by the way, there's a right way and a wrong way. There's, it's, it's one of those type of things where unless you have someone like you if you're passionate and knowledgeable about cybersecurity, unless you and people like Nick and I and others in this community and listening to this talk right now, unless we are going to make these changes in these companies ourselves, there may be issues like this that continue for years and go unchecked. And you're not going to get sued for it. It's not going to be, you know, you're not going to get in big trouble until something bad happens and you're exposed and the community is looking at you and saying, why would you ever do it like this? And that's what I have down here in red. There's a good way, a weak way, but there's not one right way to do this. There's a couple of wrong ways, but there's not just like, oh, here's the guide you have to follow. And if you do all this and check all these boxes, then you're quote unquote secure. That's not how it works, which is why it's awesome for penetration testers, red teamers, and people in cybersecurity, because it's like, if we try hard enough, we're going to get in. The adversary always has the upper hand, which is why, you know, I love doing penetration testing engagements. And I love trying to help companies become more secure because it's just, it's challenging and it's rewarding. That's what I say. Questions? So far? Before I move on? Yeah, so we've got a, we've got a few questions coming through. Um, so it was kind of similar to the, the question earlier about the 15 password minimum. And uh, the question was, shouldn't that be... A, like a minimum for Windows. Um, so if you want to answer that, and then we've got we've got a few more coming in as well as we as we go. Gotcha. So should it be a requirement for Windows? No, I don't think so. And there's the other big thing to this. I mentioned the word culture at least once already. When we had the conversation about password vaults and shouldn't everybody use a password vault? How do you kind of get over that hump? I said, well, you got to educate people. Yeah. In my experience, doing penetration testing and working with you know large and small companies across the United States there is a trade-off there's a huge trade-off be between security and convenience and if you have a user base who isn't really <laughs> happy about creating 15 character passwords you're gonna annoy your users and you're not gonna be able to grow organically you're not gonna have a huge huge following of users and your platform may never take off your product may never be successful your service may be frowned upon. If it's not easy to use, people won't use it. They're going to go to the next best thing. And if you're going to be too tight on your security, that could actually turn people off to your platform. So I just got another laptop not too long ago, and I'm creating an account on there. And 
Windows is trying to force me to log in to the Microsoft Online.com or whatever it is and create a uh, an internet-based account. And I'm like, no, I just want to do a local account. And if they would have forced me to do like a 15-character password, it would have been annoying. It'd be super annoying. And then I have to remember that, and oh, I got another password I have to remember, or another password to add to the vault. And it's just, you can't really force people. You, technically, it's easy to do. You could say, well, your minimum has to be at least 15 characters. But when you do something like that as a business, you're alienating your user base potentially, which is going to hurt you in the long run. So technically, yes. Um, in reality, though, it's not always the best choice for your business to do something like that. Otherwise, you just annoy people, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it. So breaches, what happens, how they occur? Well, it's interesting. It's interesting. I, I pulled out a few of kind of higher profile ones that a lot of us here in the United States probably have heard about or know about. Equifax being number one that uh, I wanted to highlight. At the top, anyway. Apache struts, if you're not familiar with Apache struts, don't worry, it's not that important. The point is, there's some software on the Equifax website, and Equifax didn't update it when <laughs> they probably should have. And because of that vulnerability, you know, we got the Equifax breach. Yahoo, mostly spear phishing. Same thing with iCloud. Um, how, do, how do these occur? The spear phishing attack, okay? Uh, what else? Home Depot, Target, the other HVAC systems, they had a third-party vendor management issues where weaknesses in that whole component of their business was targeted. Adobe, quote unquote, used the same encryption key for all passwords. Why am I doing a little tisk tisk for that? Because if you guys are paying attention and you're understanding the word hash, you understand that that does not equate to encryption. We don't encrypt passwords. Companies who take security seriously don't encrypt passwords in almost any case. You hash the password. Hashing is one-way function. You can't dehash. You can decrypt with a key, but you can't unhash. You have to guess or crack the password. So you wouldn't want to encrypt passwords, and you certainly wouldn't want to use the same key for all your pass, all your passwords. Uh, other popular names up there you can see for yourself, but it's interesting. And I I touched on this briefly. It's like we have more details on Stuxnet, <laughs> which was very well written of. Uh, <laughs> compared to a lot of these. It's like, it's you can go read about this, you can read about the articles that came out, and it's gonna be difficult to get all the details on this, on, on breaches like these, and all the other plethora of breaches that occur all the time. You, you, you rarely find an awesome write-up on what the root cause of the breach was. Okay, it's more often than not, oh, there's a settlement and they're paying a couple million dollars to people that may have been impacted, and they're gonna give you some credit monitoring services, and so on and so forth. So it depends. The root cause of why breaches occur totally depends. I have a little slide and slide down here. What that so how the adversary get in slide down there was actually from a workshop I gave yesterday, which is why you know as you can see I use the same template in PowerPoint. But <laughs> nevertheless, um, there's a lot of ways. And that's the OWASP top ten down there. There's a lot of flaws that could be you know, resident on an application or physically at a store that's going to allow an adversary to to cause harm. Nation state, it does happen sometimes. Okay, it does happen, but it's almost irrelevant. The point is, the adversary, with enough motivation and time, will find a way to gain access. And that's where we have to start figuring out what we can do to minimize our exposure. And this is kind of what we're at right now. For online stuff, the password fault, we already talked about that. But I got the little parentheses there use with knowledge, use with almost caution, because this could be the Achilles heel to your whole security if you have a password vault. Matter of fact, man, I worked for a company once where we had a pen test company uh, come in and do an engagement and they were able to gain access to an admin's laptop and his the admin's laptop's password vault didn't automatically close like when he was logged out or done for the day. So his password vault was sitting there open and the pen testing company was able to gain access to his machine remotely and his whole password vault. <laughs> it was an epic fail. And he's a security admin. He's a smart guy, but he made a mistake. His vault didn't close, and it was during the week of the pen test. <laughs>
Well, so the thing oh, here man. is, is, is it, was that a mistake though, not closing your vault, right? I mean, we all do it. Um, I don't think it's ever been a best practice, right? Um, sorry for interrupting too. I've just got a couple of questions that before you get too much further ahead of them, I'd like to for you to cover real quick. Go ahead. All right. So we've got are there recommend are there sites that you recommend avoiding having accounts on due to known unresolved vulnerabilities? So like are there just accounts no. that you know that you just wouldn't use personally is, is what I'm getting out of this question. Uh, no, not really. Even if it's a, a horribly insecure website, if I have to use it, you have to use it. Like if you buy a new house, you're part of an HOA, and it's like, hey, you got to go to this HOA website to submit your tickets. It's like, well, what do I have? What, what option do you have? The option you have is to create a unique, complex password and use it. What else can you do? You know, so you have minimum minimum options. So to reduce your exposure, of course, you you keep it complex, you keep it unique, and that's the best you can do. So this one, you've, you've kind of been talking about it a little bit, but it, and it's it's a hard answer. But the, the another question we have coming through is, what is a useful password policy for accounts? Usual password policy for accounts it varies from location to location depending where you work at and what what the admins have set up. Um, I think the question is more what, like, what would you recommend probably um, as a password policy and Personally, I mean, I'm not going to get into this because my password policies are don't use a password policy. It's it's something different, but I'm going to let you answer this one. <laughs> I'd look at NIST. They came out with some some recommendations I agree with. <laughs> so I'm going to say use NIST. And it, quickly on that, it's uh, have a super crazy complex password and change it like once a year or if you feel that it may have been exposed somewhere. So for me, I'll tell people on this call, everyone listening, uh, I have more than one Gmail account. For the Gmail accounts, my password is between 50 and 100 characters, period. And I don't typically change them very often. Why? Why? <laughs> yeah, so do what works for you. But I, like I said, password vault, copy, paste. I'm not remembering these things, I'm not typing them in, I'm copying and pasting them. So make it super long, make it super complex, and don't bother about changing unless you have to or you feel it's not exposed or it's about that time. About 10 minutes, Serge, or a little, yeah, about 10 minutes. Cool. All right, so for online minimization of exposure, you probably all read all this already, so I'm not gonna really delve into it much more, but you really wanna reduce your exposure. That means stop giving out personal information, stop giving out your real phone number, stop giving out information. It's your personally identifiable information, PII, your first name, your last name, your address, your email address, your phone number, your SSN, all that stuff, that's yours. Stop giving it out to companies. Stop giving it out to websites if you're serious about reducing your exposure. Because remember, we don't have control over how good of a job they're going to do as it pertains to securing our personal information. We don't have control over that. We don't know what they're doing or failing to do. For offline stuff, yeah. <laughs> when I go to the store now, I'm wearing a mask. Yeah, for COVID-19, sure. But also for, man, all those cameras watch me all the time. I'm not doing anything illegal or wrong. I just don't want to have my face on your camera all the time. You know, it's not really, not really your business to, you know, do your facial recognition in AI and get my bone structure and all that. I don't want to give that out if I don't have to. So I'm going to be using a mask probably for, uh, probably for a while now. Now, obviously, I'm not like everyone else. I'm a little bit different. Uh, you got to do what's appropriate for you. But that's just one thing. What else? Forms, documents, you go to the dentist, you go to the, the hospital. They don't need your social security number. They're going to ask for it, but they don't need it. They don't need it. So what does that mean? Don't give it to them. You don't have to fill out the form completely you don't need to tell them where you live um you know you need to tell them where you need to get your mail so you can pay the bill but take these things into account take them take it seriously if you are at the point in your career or life where you've dealt with a you know a breach of your own information or you've been a victim of identity theft or you're just trying to think about how security professionals do this this is what i do so heads up on that so what's the takeaway for this like i said i'm not going to say your account should be, you know, two FA. Change your password every week. I'm not saying annoy yourself and increase your complexity and make your life a hassle. I'm gonna say the word commensurate. 
the security that you're applying to your personal life and your business and the place you work and so on needs to be commensurate equal to the level of sensitivity of the information. So if you're logging into your bank, you're going to use two-factor and have a super complex unique password. If you're logging into something that's maybe a little bit less intense, maybe you forgo the two-factor, but you still need to use you know, your unique password that's complex. All right, what else? As we increase security, our day-to-day -day convenience goes way down. So two-factor authentication, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, it's super annoying, okay? Especially if you don't have text messaging, <laughs> okay? Uh, yeah, two-factor authentication can be annoying. And now you're like, oh, well, there's an app for that. Yeah, install the app. Now you have more apps on your phone that you have to trust and assume that they're not malicious and assume that they're being updated appropriately. There's more exposure, more vulnerabilities. So, you know, it's difficult. It's difficult. Uh, other things here, the takeaways, I've said this probably 100 times, don't reuse your passwords, get a vault. If you're, if you're savvy, if you know how to do it the right way, you got the education, get yourself a vault and do things, uh, you know, a little more securely. And then a couple other things here is just, you know, as far as exposure goes, you lose control once you start sharing your information with companies. Whether they're doing a great job of security or whether they're not, you, you really don't know unless you work there. And even then, you really don't know all the different processes in most cases. So just be aware of that. You have control over some things. You have no control over other things, as was highlighted by the demo and the whole first half of this conversation. So what you do have control over, that's where you need to own it. And the things you don't have control over, that's where you need to reduce your exposure by stop stopping sharing so much information. That's it. My last rhetorical question, don't answer it. Think to yourself, though. When was the last time you gave out your social security number? This morning. All right. Oh, dude, <laughs> seriously? <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, we do have a question, though. Uh, what is the likelihood we'll see a replacement of social security numbers with a better system in our lifetime? What are your thoughts on that? That's all it would be as a thought. I don't really have insight. I'm crappy at forecasting the future. <laughs> um, I don't know. I would in, in this culture in the United States, I would say um, it would be like a some type of national ID system. And there's a lot of people on both sides of the aisle, so to speak, that would not be happy with that. It's like a basically government tracking type of system. It would be awesome in a lot of ways, and it would be you know invasion of privacy and a horrible security issue and risk in other ways. So I don't see that happening. I know other countries do it with some great success, but uh, around here. I, in the United States, this is what I'm speaking about. I don't see that happening. It's just there'd be a lot of um, negativity coming with that. And of course, if you fail security with something like that, then we have a huge, huge exposure. And you know, once you start getting biometrics involved and switching your SSN to like some biometric ID or something that's personally identifying you, and that gets compromised, there's no going back. You know, once your your fingerprints exposed your fingerprint's out there. You can't change your fingerprint very easily. <laughs> so uh, I don't see that happening in my lifetime, but I'm wrong about a lot of things, so who knows. Cool, Serge, we got just uh, another minute left here. Let's go with this last question. Uh, if there's any other questions, everyone, you know, feel free to hit up Serge in Discord, he's here. You can, you can also email him at almost any time. Serge is a great guy, he'll answer questions whenever he gets to them. So uh, the last question I wanna pose is, thoughts on government sites that require two of each, upper, lower, numeric, and special for their password policy. So they're requiring two of each of those four aspects of the password complexity of uppercase, lowercase, numeric, and special. They're trying to do the best job they can. They've read talks like these, or like, you know, they've, they're educated, they're doing the best they possibly can. And it's inconvenient for you, it's annoying for you. I would say, do they have two-factor authentication? That's gonna be a much more of a game changer than uppercase, lowercase, two of this, two of that. Nevertheless, as long as the application works and it can support a lot of characters, it doesn't complain, oh, you, you have two special characters, but they're not the right special characters. You can't use the asterisk or the crap like that. You know, As long as it's a well-written application that can handle what it's supposed to handle, it, it is what it is. I'm not too concerned about it. It goes into your password vault. You copy and paste it anyway, so it's not that big of a deal. 